Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will start today's episode where we are welcoming back to the ATA podcast show the awesome Melina Martini. Melina is a certified trainer and counsellor, CTC, and a certified dog behaviour consultant, CDBC. She is renowned in the dog training world for her work on canine separation anxiety over more than two decades. Her books, Treating Separation Anxiety in Dogs and Separation Anxiety in Dogs Next Generation and Treatment Protocols and Practices have helped countless number of dogs and the people that love them. Her online course for guardians called Mission Possible has proven to be an invaluable resource in the industry and the success rate realized there is immeasurable. In addition to writing and lecturing for a worldwide audience, Melina oversees a team of top separation anxiety trainers and runs an internationally accessible certification program for accomplished dog professionals looking to hone their skills. Melina is passionate about furthering education in this field through science-based methods. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to have you back with us for the third time today. Melina, thank you so much for taking the time to come and hang out with us again at Animal Training Academy. Well, it's such a pleasure of mine, Ryan. I, I, I Not only do I love Animal Training Academy and all the amazing content that you uh, are making available for everyone, but I always enjoy speaking with you personally. It, it's just always such a, such a pleasure. It is, and I read your bio and am filled with inspiration uh, and admiration <laughs> for everything that you've achieved uh, and the ripples that the work that you do has created around the world. And you were asking about how having Michael Shikasho in New Zealand was recently. We had him over here over the weekend at the time of recording this podcast. Uh, and we did something we haven't done before. We, we said to Mike, hey, imagine if everyone here impacted 100 people over the rest of their lives with what they've learned here today. And I mean, that's such a small number. It's going to be so much bigger than that. Oh, and so then, much bigger. And then those people that are impacted, they impact another 50 people, whether it just be a conversation with a neighbor or someone seeing that they're using positive reinforcement. And then those people, those 50 people impact another 25 people. We did some maps, and that would the ripple effect of that, which is such an understatement, was one million two hundred fifty thousand people were going to be impacted by. Truly, it was. Wow. It was we might we might have I might have missed one number there. It was like an extra five or something at the end, but the result is like we don't really appreciate how many lives, and we're never going to see it, and we're never going to know it. But we use that word immeasurable in your bio there and I think it was a good choice of words because I think the result of your work is immeasurable. Wow thank you I really appreciate that it's it's actually interesting to me that you mentioned that because um you know we all have our moments where we think well we have imposter syndrome or we have 
doubts about what we're doing or who we are or all those things. But um, very recently, I, I just had a moment where I where I thought about it. And I thought prior to 2013, the separation anxiety was one of those things that people, dog trainers and professionals uh, around the world would say, I take aggression and I take dog, dog and human dog and I take this and that and the other. Oh, but no separation anxiety, no separation anxiety, no separation anxiety. It was a very, it was a common theme. And I feel really lucky to have been someone that kind of pulled it out of the, you know, pulled it out of the red, redheaded stepchild location and, and, and was able to make people realize that, no, this is an issue that needs our attention and needs the type of focus that, um, that we can devote to it for resolution. And I, I think that now it's everywhere. Everybody wants to, <laughs> wants to do separation anxiety, right? So I, 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 you know, I feel like I've done, I've had some sort of contribution there. Some sort of contribution, sees, she sees. <laughs> <laughs> I redid the maths just now while you were talking and yeah, some, something along those lines. So if, and, and then someone, someone came up after the class and they said, oh, well, we're going to, we're going to have 250 people in the next six months just based on our bookings in our club. And I was like, well, there you go. Like you can appreciate what the understatement is. So yeah. if you think about it, if the population of New Zealand is about 5 million and let's say you were here or Michael's here, then eventually we're going to touch 5 million people. Five million people. Isn't that crazy? It is. Well, I'm really excited to talk about your ripples today. Of course, the subject matter you have so much expertise in with creating those ripples and that is separation anxiety. Your services not only assist pet guardians with their animals in their home setting, but you also certify professional trainers to master how to assist with this challenge. And so we're going to talk to this segment of the people you serve today, professionals who want to master their ability to help others with separation anxiety. So to get us started, Melina, can, can you help us understand, can you help the listeners of this episode understand if, if you're listening and you're a professional trainer and you're getting requests to do separation anxiety cases, you're definitely not alone. With regards to the people that come to you for certification, what are, what are some of the challenges that people face? Why are people wanting to take that next step and, and become professionally certified? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, and because the the facade, the, 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 the front facing um, educational options are varied, um, you know, it's interesting. I look back 22 years ago when I started working with separation anxiety and, and none of that was there. Um, and it really boiled down to stuff a feeding toy, acclimate to a crate, uh, you know, some, some really basic suggestions. And I think we have three big problems that dog trainers that are interested in working with separation anxiety face. Uh, and the first is that there's there's not a ton of information, even though it's growing and growing and growing. And so there's sort of a philosophical side of things where there's an inability to help dogs with this pretty debilitating problem, which leads dogs to being relinquished, euthanized, or even, you know, at, at best, maybe living a compromised welfare situation. Um, and that's the dog side, but there's also the client side, right? I, I really feel like many of the guardians that are, um, that have a separation anxiety dog in their care are frustrated and feeling like a prisoner, but not sure where to turn and turning to a dog trainer who has limited experience with separation anxiety, um, is unfortunately not going to be the most efficient and effective resolution rate. I think there's another 
factor that dog trainers that are looking at taking separation anxiety uh, cases face. And that's that sort of overwhelm, that frustration and lack of confidence as a dog professional trying to work with this really complex and nuanced behavior issue and um, not really knowing how to distill that down and how to maybe track the data and how to make those day-to-day criteria decisions, which should be dynamic uh, and based in some some real life and appropriate uh, data tracking decisions, right? And then lastly, I think dog trainers that are looking to take on separation anxiety um, sort of are in the situation of having that exhausted toolbox, sort of like I said, you know, 22 years ago, it was stuff a food toy and use a crate. Uh, and that was sort of the extent of it, right? <clears throat> so the those limited tools of, of using items like that, they're not effectively helping to resolve separation anxiety. Uh, and I think it's kind of going back to the second, that overwhelm, that frustration, and having, and then the third, having that that exhausted toolbox really lee it really chips away at our confidence because our tools are so so limited um, without getting advanced education in this issue yeah and there's a lot of people that listen to this show who are new they haven't been doing it for 22 years maybe they've been doing it for 22 months sure. and they're, they're getting separation anxiety requests and they have had success with some Kongs and crates and, but they're they're inevitably going to come across whether that's quickly or or a little bit later, once they've done a few cases, uh, a dog or, or an individual that these tools, they hit a brick wall and, and they get stuck. Uh, And that, that can very quickly make you feel or question. I, I, do you have what it takes? I actually love that you bring this up, Brian. I, I don't know how much time we have, but I'm going to tell you a story. And I, uh, I'm, a, I, I'm all about the stories sometimes, but I don't know if I ever told you the story about what propelled me into working with separation anxiety, but um, I was a very green trainer 22 years ago, a uh, recent graduate of Jean Donaldson's Academy for Dog Trainers. <clears throat> and it was one of my first... I don't know, in the first few weeks or so after graduation, it was one of the very first phone calls that I received back in the day when you used to actually pick up your phone as opposed to screen your calls. Uh, <clears throat> and I picked up the phone and this woman uh, whose dog name was named Guinness, I remember them like it was yesterday, um, said, my dog has terrible separation anxiety and I, uh, I really need some help. And I, and I was very transparent. I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a very new, very green trainer. And I really would prefer for a, for a complex issue like separation anxiety, I would prefer that you work with someone more experienced. And she suddenly burst into tears and she said, okay. And, you know, through her tears, she said, I understand. But if you're going to give me a few names of trainers that can I can work with, can you make sure they work with separation anxiety? Because you are the seventh referral that I have spoken to and no one will work with separation anxiety. And it sort of tore at my heartstrings in a couple of ways. Number one, just hearing her so emotionally um, uh, impacted. Number two, <clears throat> I thought, hey, this is the kind of client that everybody wants. Someone that's not willing to take no for an answer. Like there's got to be someone that can help me and help my dog in a positive way. Uh, And so I said, listen, you're right. I'm going to probably give you two or three names and they're probably going to say they won't work with you. So if you will accept my, you know, greenness as as a professional, I will um, do what I know. And if it gets above our head, we'll go we'll go further. So I worked with her and used the traditional tools of stuffing Kongs and other food toys and using a a confinement space. And relatively quickly, we resolved the dog's issue. And so I know exactly what you're talking about. Like, oh, I got this. This separation anxiety thing, it's no problem. 
And there are dogs that those tools are absolutely sufficient, but there are a larger percentage of dogs that suffer from separation-related behavior problems that those tools would be far, far, far less than what is required. And I learned that in my very second case after I was successful with Guinness, I crashed and burned in my second case trying to apply the same tools. And that's what started me on this whole trajectory of I've got to learn more. I've got to do better by these dogs. Well, I'm sure that first client was so grateful. When, when we think about our clients and, and they're ringing us up because they leave the house and their dog paws at the door until they bleed or they tear apart the couch or they pace back and forth four hours, whatever behavior, observable behavior that the client is seeing in the dog. We're, we're, we're caught up as a dog trainer and we think, okay, cool. We have to come up with an intervention to um, help this dog meet its needs, teach new behaviors. But there's also this client there who is crying to you over the phone. Uh, and and so for the clients, if you're if you're listening to this show and you're getting requests like this, yeah, you're saving, you're you're solving the problem, the observable problem of the dog, but you're solving such a bigger problem as well for that client, aren't you? I mean, you helped that client was going through some extreme stress, and you helped give them confidence, and you helped them grow their skills and grow their knowledge. I mean, that is a gift. Honestly, it's one of the reasons that I love working with these cases and that I haven't even faltered for a moment in over 20 years from loving working with these clients because it's not just, which is a huge issue, it's not just helping the dog um, return to or or initially achieve some sense of calm about alone time. It's returning real life for the client as well. I mean, it's it's completely intertwined in in understanding that yes, the dog's welfare is is a priority, but boy, is the guardian's welfare also a priority? If you cannot leave your home, or if you are leaving your home and always worried about, am I going to get a notice from the council or the neighbors? For because my dog is barking, or is my dog going to? Am I going to return home to broken canines or ripped toenails or urine and feces all over the carpet or destroyed couches or doors or windows? Right, um, that is a distress situation that is not tenable for for most people. Uh, so it's it's horrible for the dog, but it's also really challenging for the client. And there is nothing, and people laugh at me when I say this, there's nothing that I enjoy more, Ryan, than watching a dog on Zoom or whatever video, you know, channel we're using, sleeping through an absence. It is the most riveting video, in my opinion, because I have seen that dog having a meltdown in the day in day one when we start working together. And by the time we get to that point where the dog sleeps through an absence or just curls up, um, it is it is the most exciting and sort of, you know, intoxicating high to see that we've impacted that animal's life and that guardian's life so much. And so giving as a listener of the show, you're helping clients. That is that is a problem that you're solving. You're solving the extreme stress and overwhelm and frustration and upset that the client's facing. And, and you're doing that, Melina, I would say, for the professional trainers who come to you to get certified because they are on the phone with their clients who are crying and they have we all know that work with animals in homes or whatever arena or industry you work as a consultant that the people skills and we we can be counselors and we're really uh, helping uh, clients navigate their situations and we've got to be good listeners and we've got to be empathetic but as a, as a trainer if I'm getting a call and people are crying to me and I can't help them now I'm as, as a client of yours I'm in that same position I you said it pulled at your heartstrings uh, and how, how did it feel 
for you? Can you can you can you unpack that a little bit more? And I think the listeners of the show will be in that position where, like, what does it feel like to not be able to help someone? Wow, I, I mean, it really contributes so much to those feelings of inadequacy and those feelings of, gosh, I'm a professional. Whether I've been doing this, as you mentioned earlier, for 22 years or 22 months or or two months. Um, being in a position of not being able to help someone efficiently and effectively and and, and appropriately, um, quite frankly, feels pretty darn deflating. Um, it also feels really frustrating when you think, I not only don't know exactly how to help them, but I don't even know what they necessarily need to be helped. I mean, this is such a vast field where, uh, and a vast issue where we still are faced with limited understanding about this issue and feeling like I'm not even sure what they need in order to give them what they need, you know, and, and those are, those are some tough feelings to experience as a professional. Um, and I think most, or at least many of us got into the industry of animal training and, and professional, uh, uh, dogs, dog trainers and, and, really got into this field to help the animals, but most of us also really love people too. And so that feeling of not being able to apply some sort of knowledge, some sort of tool out of our toolbox in order to resolve the issue um, can, can be a real con uh, confidence killer. Um, and I think personally that be with these very complex and nuanced behavior issues like separation anxiety, like aggression, like many others, um, there is a need to, you know, many of us are, uh, have a general knowledge, right? In a, a, a br broad and general knowledge about all aspects of dog training or animal training in general. And that's super important. But there's also, you know, it's a T-shape. We also need to go deep. There's broad and there's deep. And for behavior problems like this, I think we need to go deep while having that broad base above yeah and and obviously as a individual whom certifies trainers and as the host of this show we we do not want you the listener feeling like that that is we want we want everyone to be empowered to, to positively impact and the lives of of the dogs and all of the animals and, and humans they work with and i know uh, in 2023 we don't need to feel like that because there is so much online resources and individuals like yourself who what what we need is the ability to find these people so that's one reason i love this podcast show so much is, is we get to connect people but you also mentioned one other problem that i just want to quickly touch on and that is that <laughs> This is this is it's a great tragedy because if if you're not here and you're not certifying people and people aren't learning the skills to deal with uh, these cases to upskill themselves to increase their knowledge to increase their confidence, then dogs are dying, behavioural euthanasia, or suffering, and humans suffer. They become martyrs for their pets. They do. Ask me how I know. <laughs> Ask you how you know. How do you know, Ryan? Well, I know one of the other problems that animal trainers have is marketing themselves. You and I were talking about this right. beforehand. And so training for trainers, and, and I was looking at a post by a, a good trainer friend of mine on social media just today and yesterday. Trainers own animals can suffer because we spend so long marketing ourselves and That's trying right. to build our business and doing all of our accounting that we don't train our own animals. We just literally don't have time. Um, that's how I know. <laughs> and, and and Phoebe decided to come and join me just because you were talking like, about are you, that. Are you talking about? Are you talking about me? Are you talking about me? Um, are you talking about me? And that can be embarrassing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you might be a trainer who was in, in who's got your own dog who has problems, and you want to go. Well, maybe I'll get certified because I can help people deal with my own problem. But it's embarrassing to reach out to to someone and say, "Hey, look, I'm a trainer, but I need help with my own dog." Do you, do you get that? I love that this happened to come up, Ryan, because um, 13 years ago, 
So I had already been working with separation anxiety for about you know, almost 10 years. Uh, and 13 years ago, I adopted a lovely little girl. Her name is Teeny Demartini. And within 24 hours of bringing her home, I saw that the sun, the moon, the stars, all the planetary uh, motions really revolved around my head for her. And there was no question that she was suffering with separation anxiety. But I had already been specializing in this issue for 10 years and uh, or about 10 years. And I reached out to every single one of my trainer colleagues and I said, I need help. I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. And at that time, um, people had been calling me the Sepanx Queen, which is a title that I was, you know, glad to have fade away. But uh, <laughs> but I reached out to every professional I knew and, and they were like, aren't you the Sepanx Queen? Like, don't you know what to do? And I am so glad, Ryan, that I went through that experience because it is both empowering and humbling in equal measure to realize that your own dog is a very different experience uh, than observing someone else's dog and counseling someone else. Um, because we have our own emotions involved with our individual dogs and and how we are seeing their behavior, et cetera. And so having that outside professional help and guidance makes a tremendous difference, even for us as professionals. So as a professional, whether it's your own dog that's suffering from a behavior issue or whether it's you that is worried that you don't have the skills for something like a separation related behavior problem case, get that, get that feeling of being both empowered and maybe mildly humbled, but humbled is a beautiful thing as well. It's it's not something to be, you know, to be running away from. Well, thank you for sharing that and being vulnerable with us. And you as a listener of this show, you're, you're getting requested to assist with separation anxiety cases. You know that dogs might be dying. Dogs are suffering. Humans are suffering. It's a uh, it's bigger than you. This is a big problem. And you are getting requests and you are limited by your knowledge and skills. You're aware of that. You might label it imposter syndrome because you want to help out, but and maybe you can help out, but you, you got all of these undesirable pressures on you uh, and feelings that come with being a professional animal trainer, professional dog trainer. Um, and, and you've got this toolkit, but it is hitting a brick wall and, and you know that you need more to help more. Uh, you've been through this yourself, Melina. Uh, you've been doing this for a couple of decades now. Uh, so you understand and you're in a unique position to help our listeners of this show who I've just described. Um, so the program that we've been talking about today is your your CSAT, your certification program. So, so you said you've been doing this for 22 years. How long have you been doing the, the certification program for? The certification program launched in 2000, end of 2013. So almost like beginning of 2014 is when that program launched. Um, and if we have time later, I'll tell you a funny story about that because you know my friend Veronica Bautel and she had something to do with that. Oh, yay. I'm going to actually see Veronica Botel in about five days' time. Oh, that's fantastic. She's now so the pandemic. Now the pandemic is over, like, everyone's, like, every week there's, like, someone cool in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... So you you understand you you totally understand your team understands you you have helped as we've talked about immeasurable teams dogs and humans out over the last since you've been doing it I was I was wondering if you could hopefully share with the listeners um, some case studies of people who have who are trainers who had hit that wall who were who are feeling a little bit overwhelmed questioning their ability to be a trainer feeling stressed and upset and not being able to help knowing the impact of that on the lives of the clients they had to turn down um, and and we're, we're aware of the limitations of the skills and knowledge they currently had and and then they they reached out to you can you share some of your favorite case studies of trainers that you've helped overcome some of these hurdles uh, I'm absolutely happy to do that and and it was great Ryan that you kind of gave me a 
uh, a little hint in advance of today that that I might be sharing some case studies. And I will say also that it was the hardest decision because the number of case studies of, of dog professionals whose lives have been completely changed in this arena that I have worked with is just inestimable. I, I couldn't even count. Uh, and and I feel so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a very um, uh, pr- a proud person in many ways, but I feel so proud of these individuals and proud that I was able to um, be a catalyst for their for their lives changing and their training careers changing. Um, so the first one I want to share is of one of my lovely CSAC colleagues, uh, and her name is Jane Wolf, and she is in Michigan. And <clears throat> Jane um, had a separation anxiety dog. She was not a dog trainer yet. She had a separation anxiety dog and she was doing the let's Google and find out what I can do to fix my dog kind of thing and tried all of the tips and tricks, right? Top five tips, top three tricks, all those things that are that are available on the internet uh, and was having zero success. She stumbled across my book and started to implement some training on her own and started to realize some success. And as she was starting to realize some success, she kind of got bit by the bug of dog training. Funny story, actually. She realized that certification in separation anxiety was a specialty. Uh, and so, and she thought, I would love to probably do that someday, but I don't know what I'm doing. But this whole idea of working with dogs could be pretty cool. So she went to the back of my book and looked at, looked at my bio and saw that I was a graduate of the Academy for Dog Trainers. She applied, became a professional dog trainer, started training dogs in all manner of behaviors, except, funny enough, for separation anxiety because she did not feel qualified, even though she had made such tremendous progress with her own dog. Uh, Once she had been a certified uh, trainer and counselor for a while, she applied to our separation anxiety uh, certification program. And it was it has been so beautiful watching her career because she has transitioned now. She has transitioned to almost 100% exclusively separation anxiety. She has a couple of other little interests like husbandry and stuff. So she does a, you know, a few things on the side. But, but from a client standpoint, she is working exclusively with separation anxiety dogs. And when I, when I told her that I was thinking uh, that I would share her story, Story, I said, what is the most impactful thing that has resulted um, from you receiving the education that you have received? And she said, and I think this is so cute because it was, it didn't, it caught me off guard. She said, I never thought in my lifetime that I would work with enough clients that I would start to not remember dogs' names. And that may sound like a negative, right? But it's actually a huge positive. She's like, I have worked with over 500 separation anxiety dogs that have gone from zero seconds of alone time to full resolution and calm relaxation when alone. She's like, I'm starting to forget dogs' names at this point. And I... I, I thought that was a really beautiful reflection of, you know, where she started and where she where she is now. Uh, and she's thriving and she she actually loves this I- issue and these dogs and these people so much. Um, she heads up um, some of the education. Uh, we have monthly meetings for all graduates of my program and she heads up that educational um, resource for everyone. So is that, is that how a lot of people become certified with you? Do they read your book first, then gain some knowledge, and then get certified? What is the pathway for most people? Yeah, um, the pathway is simple in that we we are only accepting applications from, or only, uh, yeah, accepting applications, I guess is the right way to say it, um, from experienced dog professionals. Um because it's such a nuanced and deep dive 
uh, into a particular behavior problem. Um, the dog professionals need to have behavior counseling experience prior to working uh, toward getting this certification. Uh, we actually recently changed it, though, Ryan. It's funny that you asked about reading the book and, and taking the course and things. Um, we have now, through there's an application process, submit an application, you go through an intensive interview, uh, committee reviews, and then uh, um, acceptance will happen from there. Uh, but upon acceptance, we give access to all of our students to not only the book, but also our online self-paced course, Mission Possible, as a jumping start to sort of prepare them for the really intensive 15-week program that they're going to be experiencing. Uh, and boy, that just maybe wets people's whistle a little bit. I mean, we take a pretty deep, 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 deep dive into behavior, behavior analysis, uh, for separation anxiety um, and data tracking and all the rest. So that first step is that application, three years uh, minimum of behavior experience, training, dog training and behavior experience to be um, considered for acceptance. So if you've got three years experience uh, and you're looking to upskill yourself, looking to grow your knowledge, looking to grow your confidence, wanting to help more dogs and have a bigger positive impact, the process is apply and then you go through the interview process uh, and then you come out the other side, increase skills, and increase knowledge, other. increase confidence and increase, helping yeah. more animals. And helping more animals. And, and I will say one of the cool things about this program is that even just going through the program, it's a pretty rich and, and diverse education about how to work with separation anxiety, dogs and, and, and guardians that, that are caring for these dogs. But it also, we've created a pretty amazing community uh, and, you know, I look at your community that you have at ATA, uh, and I feel pretty proud that we also have this cool community of people that understand this particular behavior issue so intimately and so deeply, and that we can hold each other up. And sometimes that means celebrating together. Sometimes that means commiserating over, oh, we made it to 20 minutes of alone time. And then the dog was left alone during a thunderstorm and it all fell apart. You know, we can we can all be there for one another. And, and that community is a really powerful one. So it's fun to not just take the educational piece and start working with clients, but also to be part of a very um, like-minded community. Awesome. And that sounds amazing. If you are able to apply for certification with Melina and you're thinking about doing it, can you can you help the listeners understand what they can expect if they are to become accepted in the program? Uh, if there was three things that would happen from acceptance to being fully certified, what would that process look like for them? Yeah, the program is um, as, as as already mentioned, pretty intensive, uh, and so upon acceptance. Uh, depending on at what point in time the acceptance happens, there's typically a few months prior to the, or, or more prior to the uh, starting of the course. Um, and I really encourage people to read or reread uh, the book um, and dive into the Mission Possible course and prepare themselves for, for a pretty um, comprehensive educational process. It's a very fast paced course. Um, we meet every Tuesday and Friday, but at the end of every discussion, live discussion group, we meet in Zoom. At the end of every 90 minute discussion group, there's a new lesson released with webinars, with video, with written content, with research articles, with and that homework that is also released in that lesson is due prior to the very next discussion group. So it's it's fast and its turnaround is is pretty demanding. Um, one of the things that I love about this program and and if anybody's interested in going to see some of the testimonials on my website about people that have taken this program 
is that obviously this is all about separation related behavior problems. But we dive into some content that people constantly that are graduating this program are constantly telling me it made me pivot and change and adjust all of my behavior cases because I now had a new understanding of how to identify uh, thresholds of, of perception and thresholds of stimulus aversiveness and things like that. Uh, threshold, anticipatory thresholds, et cetera. Or I under had a new understanding of how to track data effectively that will allow me to dynamically make decisions when I'm criteria setting for any given animal. Um, and so I, I, I would say what to expect is three plus months of nose to the grindstone, couple times a week. And we, we tell people that they need to devote minimally eight to 12 hours a week for the 15 weeks. Uh, and so that, that should be expected. And, and it's, it's very heavily deadline driven. Um, what, what we do on Friday is dependent on what we did on Tuesday, which is dependent on what we're going to do in the next class as well. And upon graduation, it's the fun, most fun thing, by the way, that we celebrate together. Uh, and then when people uh, graduate successfully, we um, we bring them into our closed community. We have educational opportunities moving forward and even continuing mentorship and things like that. So it's it's not like graduate and see you later. It's, it's, it's a lifelong uh, portion of being part of this great community. Awesome. So in, in a nutshell, read slash reread read your book, do the course. Uh, and then after that, it's an eight to 12 hour commitment a week, roughly You've got to attend the weekly curriculum topics and do the homework for the next session. Uh, and then you graduate with your new skill set, your new knowledge base and, and your new confidence that you can deliver for your clients uh, results with their dogs. And you can also help your clients develop more confidence. I mean, the 500 people plus you said, uh, was it Mrs. Wolf? What's her first name, sorry? Jane Wolf, yeah. Jane, Jane Wolf. Uh, great name for a dog trainer, obviously. I know, right? <laughs> her, business, her business Ryan. name is Good, Good Wolf. <laughs> So, I mean, the, and we could do the maths on that. We did the maths on ripples before. I mean, it's it's humongous, the the, the impact that gaining the, this skill set and this uh, broad knowledge base uh, can have for, for you, your career, and the clients that you work with. Hey, I think you've got another case study for us. I do. Um, I have a, uh, and like I said, it was so hard to choose, but... Um, Bob Ryder is another case that came to mind when we were mentioning case studies. And Bob, I think, represents a lot of dog professionals. He had been a very experienced professional dog trainer for 10 years, was extremely successful in his community uh, in Illinois. And he was, and boy, do a lot of people relate to this, driving from client to client and in-person sessions and the myriad of behavior problems that we're seeing uh, and how that can lead to a little bit of um, I don't know, burnout or a little bit of overwhelm, right? There's just so many moving parts. Uh, but he realized that the one behavior problem that he did not have adequate tools to resolve was separation anxiety. And he felt kind of inadequate because he was the premier trainer in his, in, in the Illinois, Chicago area. Um, and felt pretty inadequate because the, all the vets and VBs were referring everything to him and the separation anxiety cases that were coming to him. He was like, I, I got to send you somewhere else, even though he was the leading trainer in that area. So he took some time to decide. He was like, do I do I really want? And one of the reasons I think I mentioned Bob is that I think a lot of people have some trepidation about, do I really want to take on separation anxiety? Uh, do I want to be that involved? Uh, so he took some time to decide and looked through a lot of our materials on our website and finally decided to apply. And, and you know, of course, he successfully uh, got through the, the program. 
Uh, and uh, he started to work with a few clients after he graduated. And then it became, it went from the one or two to the two to four to the five or eight. And slowly but surely, he pivoted his entire business to an online separation anxiety business and was able to sort of retire the driving from client to client to client to client home. Um, and I, I I mention this because I think it's important for many of us to have, uh, I know for me, I'm getting awfully long in the tooth. And I feel that having a way to remain in this industry, helping dogs, helping people, but Maybe after a certain age, you know, you're not wrangling dogs and driving 100 miles a day around your location. And I think it's a beautiful way to either look at further down the line uh, for slowing down or to say, you know, I love my puppy classes and I love my in-person aggression dog uh, clients, but I want a balance in my life. And, and Bob did that. He created a balance between his in-person and his online and ultimately decided to pursue 100% separation anxiety and, and is now doing that. He actually just was recently visiting here, which was one of the reasons that, you know, he came to mind. Uh, I got to meet him in person. And he is now not only extremely successful in his community in Illinois, the university local to him reached out and said, we hear that you are the ex local expert on separation anxiety and we would like you to present to our uh, a community of students. So he's living the dream. And I just, so I'm so proud of him. I'm so proud of Jane. And um, I, I see the kinds of impacts that these, that this kind of work can have on people's lives. So if you're like him or you're like Jane, get certified. And and how does how does one how does one get certified? Where do they have to go? They have to go to my website, um, melenadmartini.com. And that'll I think you can probably pop that in the show notes, right? Uh, there's a forward slash trainers that will take you directly to this segment on my website that has to do uh, with becoming certified for professional dog trainers. There's a lot of information there that you can peruse uh, and uh, and there's the application there as well. Um, the application is pretty substantial uh, because we really want this to be someone's specialty as opposed to um, someone, we, we need that broad based knowledge first before we start to help someone apply that deep, uh, deep dive into some, to, into a specialty. So it's a pretty substantial application. So take your time with it. <clears throat> but if people aren't quite ready, they can read one of your books or they can do your course. How did, how did I get hold of a book and how did they, where did they go to do your course? Yeah. So the, the book is available on Amazon and everywhere else, but I happened to feel strongly that we should support our publisher and the most amazing people at dogwise.com. Um, so please consider getting the book from there. It's available both in ebook and in, in, um, paperback. Um, the online self-paced course called Mission Possible is available through my website. Um, it is my website forward slash possible. Um, we'll bring you directly to the course page, um, but feel free to jump around my website. There's a lot of free resources and blogs and content that if you're wondering about would becoming a CSAT be the right thing for me, take time, digest some of that content. Um, that we even have a page about would you want to become a CSAT? Is it right for you? And there's a page on our website about that that you can learn about it. So um, there's a lot of content out there. So take your time, consider it. Um, but we certainly love seeing some pretty amazing trainers come through our program. Amazing. So if you're listening, we do not want you to feel overwhelmed. We don't want you to feel stressed. We don't want you to feel upset that you can't 
help your clients with separation anxiety and obviously we want you to be able to help all of the dogs to the best of your ability that come your way and their human clients uh, and we don't want we don't want dogs suffering i mean that it's the reason that you started dog training in the first place. Uh, we want you to build your skills, build your knowledge, build your confidence as a certified separation anxiety trainer and have the biggest possible positive impact on all of the lives of the animals and humans you work with. Melina, once again, thank you so much for sharing everything today with us. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up today? I think my final thought is to share that this has been, as I alluded to earlier, sort of the redheaded stepchild of separation anxiety. Uh, and I think as we get more and more really qualified professionals that are working with these complex and nuanced behavior issues, that we're starting to gain not just success with the dog and the guardian, starting to gain more knowledge. And one of the things that I welcome people to be part of this community is that it's only been 22 years since I've been doing this. And I hope 22 years from now, we will have even more successful protocols, more efficient means of resolution. And, and I hope to look upon that and say, remember back in the day when uh, we only knew this. And that's really that research that we're embarking on and that that in treating the dog in front of you as an individual with their separation related behavior problem is is helping us to collect a ton of data and information that I think is going to not just propel the training for separation anxiety dogs, but any type of fear unlearning, I think will be impacted in the future. And I, and I would welcome people to be a part of that. That's an exciting future. Uh, we will link to everything we've talked about today in the show notes. Melina, this has been so much fun. So from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to come and hang out with us again at Animal Training Academy. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Ryan. Thank you so much. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.